Barbara Smith, and I'm president of Westport Grange. We are delighted tonight to have you here and to have this conversation um, in this beautiful hall. Um, if you have any interest in knowing more about the Grange, we would love to be able to share information with you about what we do here. Uh, we are, the Grange is an institution that's been around for over 100 years in this location and it has been the center and cornerstone of this community. And we are revitalizing it in very exciting ways, uh, looking at agriculture and the environment. And we have two programs coming up next month um, on the topic of green burials and, so, and natural death. Here. Paul, come back in here for a second. You can't escape. You can't escape. Uh, I, I also chair uh, the Westport Climate Resilience Committee, and we have uh, several subcommittees, and I'll get into that in a little bit. This is a presentation by our agriculture subcommittee, so we're here to talk about agriculture. And one of the people who's been fighting uh, for this, is Westport a, a right to farm community? I think yes. I've seen a sign once or twice. Uh, one of the people who's been uh, fighting for agriculture uh, for us up on Beacon Hill for seven terms is Representative Paul Schmidt. And uh, he's about to uh, relinquish the reins. And uh, I think we all owe him a round of applause for what he's done. Thank you, Paul. Paul is a farmer himself, and thank you, Paul. I know you've got uh, a, a lot uh, going on in your schedule, but we appreciate your coming here, and we appreciate all the support you've given to Westport, especially the agricultural community. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, let me just, uh, be, before turning it over to Joseph Inglesby, give you a, a minute or two on the Climate Resilience Committee. Uh, the select board uh, asked uh, the planning board to uh, figure out how uh, climate change is affecting the town of Westport and uh, uh, gather some people together, anyone who was interested in that uh, large question, and, and uh, pick their brains and come up with what the impacts are on the town of Westport and then uh, what the town should do about it. Uh, and so uh, the, the planning board established this committee, the Climate Resilience uh, Committee. And we said, whoa, climate change, that, that is a huge issue. Uh, how, it's like trying to eat an elephant, you know? How, how do you even get your arms around? And so we said, well, there's probably any number of ways you could carve this uh, big problem into smaller, more digestible pieces. But uh, we decided to, to carve it into uh, an issue of uh, water. And the subcommittee on water is chaired by Mike Sullivan, who's right here, uh, which deals with things like sea level rise or storms. Uh, we have a, uh, a subcommittee on health. So what are the health impacts from uh, higher temperatures or uh, the health impacts from expanding disease vectors as you get warmer temperatures that don't constrain uh, ticks or other things like that. We have a subcommittee on infrastructure. What happens is uh, uh, sea level rise uh, may wipe out uh, exit routes from various people. Uh, 
uh, or sea, uh, uh, saltwater intrusion uh, gets into septic systems, other parts of our infrastructure. So there's an infrastructure. Uh, but, uh, and then somebody said, you know, we have historic structures. And as is the case with uh, many historic communities, the oldest houses tend to be built right near the water's edge. Uh, and so they're particularly vulnerable. So what might we do about historic structures, which might be buildings or graveyards or the things like the walls uh, right near the head of Westport. So there's a, a committee on historic structures. Uh, but you, you cannot escape that, uh, uh, and there's an outreach committee, but you cannot escape that Westport is defined uh, by agriculture. And uh, you all know that uh, farmers and growers have dealt with change for as long as there have been farmers and growers because change is a constant in a farmer's life. All you have to do is see a stone wall in a forest to know that things have always been changing and farmers always have to deal with that change, whether it's a change in weather or whether it's a change in technology or whether it's a change in markets. Uh, Fred Dabney and I, 20-something uh, years ago, uh, created CMAP because uh, there were changes that were threatening farmers and growers in, in markets and other things like that. And we said, we need an organization to, to help farmers and growers through that. And that was um, the beginning of CMAP. Well, climate change also poses uh, changes as uh, temperatures increase, as the hydrological cycle increases. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to understand what those changes were and what the impacts are on the agriculture and uh, aquaculture communities, fishing communities, and what we might do to assist people in those communities. Understand the impacts, and then what do we do to assist? And uh, we have two great uh, chairs in this uh, uh, subcommittee, Ray Raposa from Hayrays, uh, you know him, so you don't have to raise your hand, Ray, because I think people know who you are. Oh, you raise your hand anyway, just in case there couldn't possibly be a person in Westport that doesn't know Ray. And, uh, and Joseph Inglesby. And uh, Joseph is a, uh, uh, a landscape architect who has consulted all over this country and in Canada on environmental design issues. He, he ran a uh, farm in Marshfield for uh, many years that dealt with uh, heirloom uh, fruits, uh, blueberries, apples, pears, and others that uh, were sold to uh, high-end restaurants in, in Boston and moved to Westport uh, a few years ago and uh, uh, in a historic house where he's still raising uh, heirloom uh, fruits. And so uh, he, he knows farming and growing because he's practiced that. And uh, uh, I did a, a tour with Joseph in New Bedford of historic trees uh, that were there before New Bedford was, and I can't tell you how much I learned from, from Joseph. Uh, he's, uh, a very, as you'll, you're about to find out, a very knowledgeable person. Uh, so let me uh, turn it over to Joseph, but l let me say the purpose of this is uh, we eventually want to produce a report 
for the select board. But we, we probably have 25 or 30 people on the Climate Resilience Committee. Uh, that isn't anywhere near enough uh, because this is a big topic. It's a complicated topic. Uh, and so uh, when you ask people for uh, their opinion and you show them a blank piece of paper, uh, what you get is a blank look, just like the paper. Uh, and so uh, what we're doing with all the committees is trying to give people, instead of a blank piece of paper, is a rough draft on, you know, here's the water issues that Mike's done, or here are the health issues that Phil Weinberg's done, or in this case, what you get here in a first draft, here's what we think the agricultural issues are. Uh, so what I want you to think about is this is our very uh, preliminary first draft of how climate change affects the agricultural. And I, as you listen, I want you to think or take notes, wow, you guys missed this, or you're paying way too much attention to this and not enough attention to that. Right? This is a first draft, and we want you to tell us what you think we get right and what you think we've gotten wrong. And if we, this is a beginning of a broader conversation, and if we engage in this conversation, then this becomes a much uh, better report and a much smarter report because it reflects you and it reflects so much more experience. I don't know how many decades of experience we've got collected in the Grange. And again, thank you, Barbara, very much, you and the other members of the Grange for allowing us to have it here. Uh, but uh, we need your help on this. And if you want uh, to be involved, uh, beyond tonight, please, please let us know. Uh, there's not a, a finite number of membership slots in this, in this group. Uh, let us know. Uh, so with that, Joseph, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're on. Thank you, John Bullard, because he's been the general who's marshaled the troops for how many years now? A couple of years. A couple of years. So in the past six months, I've been involved with the uh, Westport Climate Resilience Subcommittee for Agriculture. And if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down. And uh, we define agriculture both as farming of land and sea. And so in this instance, we're looking at agriculture, we're looking at forestry, we're looking at shell fishing, we're looking at aquaculture and fishing, which would include anadromous, diadromous, and uh, pelagic fishing, which is from fresh water to salt water. And we're looking today at the impacts and adaptation of climate change on agriculture in a changing world. So, uh, uh, first of all, if you don't mind, I'm gonna put on my glasses. Um, so the town of Westport is developing a climate resilience plan to research, review, and make recommendations for future strategies to effectively deal with climate change. And we should, uh, take note and uh, to the uh, agricultural subcommittee members, who's Raymond Raposa, who's the chairman, uh, John Bullard, uh, Raymond Elias, Joseph Inglesby, Sean Leach, Michael Sullivan, and Jeff Canton, who's a member at large. And they've been charged to produce an interim report focused on agriculture. Uh, forestry, shell fishing, aquaculture, and, and anadromous and pelagic fisheries in this right to farm um, and fishing community on the South Coast. So I guess that I was charged to um, do the research and writing and I, I supplied farming photographs within the report, um, but I also would like to give special thanks to uh, Michael Barris, who's the Westport Town Planner, uh, Chris Leonard, who's the Westport Director of Marine Services, and Ross Moran, 
uh, who's the director of the West Coast Land Conservation Trust, for their assistance. And why are we doing this? If you look at the 2023 USDA Plant Hardening Zone Map, you'll notice that uh, between uh, last year, or 20, uh, 2022 and uh, 2023, there's been a 2.5 degree uh, difference in temperatures warmer than uh, across the entire contiguous United States. Um, so that Westport is now designated as zone seven a, which is zero to five degrees Fahrenheit, and if you define that, that's the uh, the annual uh, uh, temperature, extreme minimum temperatures uh, for 2023. Uh, so why? Uh, 2023 was the warmest year uh, in recorded history, precipitating natural disasters worldwide. The consequential effects of the natural disasters are mounting in terms of damage to agriculture, erosion, habitat destruction, uh, pollinator loss, and the regional spread of insect-borne diseases such as Lyme disease and malaria as climate continues to become wetter and warmer. Destructive insects as, as beech leaf aphids and diseases as beech leaf disease proliferate uh, without killing frosts and low winter temperatures. Warm winters have triggered an exploding deer population in Westport and the surrounding communities to the detriment of farmers' crops. Those who shellfish, lobster, and fish in, wet, in freshwater and saltwater must deal with the impacts of localized climate change, or warming oceans, ocean acidification, sea level rise, and increased storm severity. These risks will require resilience and adaptation today and tomorrow. Westport on the south coast of Massachusetts must plan for the future. So what are the risk drivers um, for agriculture and fisheries? These include, one, localized climate change would include temperature and precipitation. Two, increased storm severity and frequency. Three, sea level rise. Four, warming oceans. Five, ocean acidification. And six, changes to the Gulf Stream. And the local risks include drought, flooding, soil erosion, crop failures, landscapes, livestock stress, pollinator decline, disease and pest vectors, food insecurity, zonal forest changes, invasive species, and aquatic species decline and migration. And so this afternoon, I'm hoping we can discuss these and what can be done to help expedite uh, change to uh, become more resilient to climate change. So Westport, if you look at it, uh, is, it has a 50.1 square miles or 32,062 acres of land. Of these areas, 7,141 acres are in, are in uh, conservation. Of the 2,054 acres of the agricultural preservation restriction, including APRs in Chapter 61A, uh, with 464.87 acres in the Chapter a 61 forestry program. And if you break it down for agriculture, um, which I hope you can see, I know it's, it's difficult, uh, field crops with, uh, uh, with hay and alfalfa include 1,815 uh, 1, acres, 0.67. Uh, truck crops, which include vegetables and flowers, 200.75 acres. Orchards, which include pears, apples, and vineyards, 128.82 acres. And for pasture, 2,051.08 acres. If you total those all up, it comes to 4,196.32 acres. Looking at land use uh, for Westport, you can see it's broken down from uh, federal, state, county, municipal, uh, public nonprofits, land trusts, conservation organizations, nonprofits, private, other and unknown. And if you look at the map, you can see that there's fragmentation here. And the hope is that over years, with the help of the town of Westport and the Westport Land Conservation Trust, that this fragmentation could be uh, 
solidified so that you would have a natural buffer zone, especially along the rivers and, and streams and, and lands bordering uh, the bay or, or, or fresh and saline water. What is critically important is agricultural productivity, and the focus is on soil health. And here you can see Hannah and Ben of Skinny Dip Farm uh, working the soil, and on the other side, sort of the dream of, 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 of perfect soil and perfect productivity. But healthy soils are critical for agricultural productivity. Soils play a key role in the ecosystems across Commonwealth, sequestering carbon, supporting food production and other plant growth, absorbing water and filtering pollutants. Changes in the seasonality and intensity of rainfall events due to climate change are expected to exacerbate soil erosion, threatening these ecosystem services. In addition, eroded soils from terrestrial ecosystems and agricultural lands can negatively impact aquatic ecosystems, contributing to eutrophication and reduced water quality which can have a knock-on effect on human health. And that's through a, uh, the Massachusetts Climate Change Assessment of 2022. Um, what's interesting to know and to realize is that soil is a living organism. It's the foundation of life on Earth. And a handful of soil contains billions of archaea bacteria and other organisms including fungi, algae, plants, single cell organisms such as amoeba and animals. Relative to the carbon contents, bacteria are higher in nitrogen than fungi. Bacteria also have shorter life cycles. When they die or are consumed by another organism such as nematodes, um, plant available nitrogen is released. Fungi live longer and less nitrogen is released when they decompose. So what is the issue today is that industrial farming has sort of stripped the, far, stripped the, the soils of not only their nutrients, uh, which you would find in, in the produce that you buy in your supermarkets, but also is stripping out part of this, this life cycle, this uh, cycle of life that you see. And it is a cycle of life from decomposition to all of the layers that go through uh, their various life forms. Uh, soil is a, a living and breathing organism. And uh, we'll talk about uh, the interconnection with plants in a moment. Now, if you were to uh, either look at your handouts or look at the mapping, um, what you'd see here is that um, Westport is blessed with agricultural soils that are prime and statewide and have unique significance. And they're broken down according to certain categories, and certain of these categories are, are critical uh, for Westport. And uh, Westport does have uh, uh, sufficient soils that are being farmed right now, and I think the planning board is aware of the need to protect these soils uh, from subdivision development in, in future. Um, so it may be difficult to, to see those. Let's see uh, if I can find a larger scale version here. So let me just give you an example. So the Paxton Fine Sandy uh, Loams, which is sort of a, uh, loams, which is rocky, uh, is 3%, 3 to 8% slopes are fine for improved pasture. So in other words, if you look at, uh, look at the mapping here, you can see that westward is, is, is covered with colors, and the colors are good for agriculture. And uh, so it's sort of critical to uh, protect those lands uh, today and in future, and also to protect the soils that exist. So we're going to outline eight key strategies for doing that. Um, uh, you can see uh, Derek Christensen, a former farm of his, uh, here. Um, um, the eight, key, the eight key strategies listed below are actions that farmers can take to reduce the risk and improve sustainability on their farm. Many of the best management practices may not be new to farmers, but taken together, they can help increase resiliency on the farm over the short and the long term. Uh, note, strategies seven and eight are local Westport recommendations. One is focus on soil health. 
And I think uh, I'll just review some of the strategies. One is to uh, reduce the tillage frequency and intensity and transition to low-till or no-till planting methods where feasible. Um, second is to increase organic matter inputs into the cover crops, crop residue, manures, and compost. Use winter and summer cover crops between main crops to maximize soil surface protection. And then use tillage methods which preserve plant residues on the soil surface. The goal is to minimize time when no plant covering, there's no plant covering on the fields. And then develop a rotational plant to maximize use of perennial crops to the rotation to avoid some of the tillage requirements. And then reduce soil compaction by minimizing equipment passes over the fields then avoid fall tillage and bear winter fallow wherever possible. Now, these are sort of very straightforward, but um, if they're implemented, you will see an improvement in the soil. Second is to officially manage water resources and risks. And uh, to, this would be to improve irrigation efficiency using latest technologies, um, expand and improve water supply systems to meet future demand, time fertilizer and manure applications based on weather forecasts, construct oversized and covered manure pits to minimize overflow risk during rainfall events, and then consider manure composting and vermiculture as organic methods to in incorporate manure to enrich the farm soil, and then plant or manage riparian buffers along streams and ponds uh, to capture remaining runoff and integrate agroforestry into farming systems to improve water use efficiency during dry periods. And what we're looking at in this illustration is a farm on Main Road. And an aerial view of, of this farm, uh, which is now one of the uh, uh, holdings of the, uh, through the Westport Land Trust, and what was done to, to deal with the manure overflow here, which has been quite successful in all, all uh, go into the details on this later. And while we're on the subject, I'm not certain if you're aware of the work of John Todd. John Todd is a visionary. He's quite brilliant. And he's been working for years. Uh, he has an office in Woods Hole. And I knew John as part of the New Alchemy Institute um, at Woods Hole. And what he's done He's, he's developed a way of dealing with wastewater treatment that uses all ecological processes. And I remember visiting uh, Providence, Rhode Island to a, a model plant that was done uh, for uh, some of the neighborhoods in Providence that went through a whole series of, of, of ecological filtering uh, from a, a sort of a, a simple process uh, bringing in more and more organisms as it reached the end. Well, at the end was a water faucet, and you could, with a glass, it was so clean, you could actually drink the water that had been sewerage before. Um, and he has a, uh, a center. He's done many projects worldwide, but there's one which is accessible, which is the Omega Center of Echo Machines uh, in Rhinebeck, New York. And... Uh, uh, it treats up to 52,000 gallons of, of uh, wastewater a day um, and used for irrigation in the leaching field. And then the treatment is accompanied through a combination of septic and equalization tanks and anoxic tanks, aerated aquatic cells, um, outdoor wetlands, and recirculating sand filters. And the Echo Machines is housed in a state-of-the-art greenhouse that is also used as a classroom event space and yoga studio. And I can speak from experience um, from visiting the new alchemy that, uh, that blends the architecture with the landscape with all of the, the green components to make this uh, sort of living machine, and it is. Uh, so it's something that if you're not familiar with, with John Todd uh, and the New Alchemy Institute and his work, I'd recommend looking it up. So the next uh, of the eight key strategies for climate smart farming is to utilize integrated pest management. And this you should stay uh, abreast of the threats and be aware of life cycles and how the, uh, the pests spread. And uh, also deal with, uh, uh, use crop varieties and livestock lineage with resistance to pests and pathogens and so on. Uh, but the idea is to minimize the use of, of chemicals and, and fertilizers in the process of, of farming. 
uh, to instead use uh, permaculture and organic um, uh, techniques, which work. Uh, and here we're looking at a diversification. Uh, so we have uh, the ore farm and we have Nokachoke orchards here. And, uh, and, and then uh, this is number four is to diversify the farm enterprises, uh, species, crop varieties, and breeds. And uh, so you can do this. Um, well, first of all, you have to be open to change and choose a variety of, of commodities and farm products and services that insulate against weather, environment, market, and geop geopolitical threats. And then also to diversify crop production by extending crop rotation, intercropping with multiple species or varieties, which you saw uh, uh, Derek Christensen had been doing and most farmers are doing. And then select crop varieties based on maturity dates and genetics to match the anticipated season length, rainfall, drought patterns, and pest and pathogen pressures. And then also uh, consider controlled environmental agriculture to extend the growing season, diversifies operation, and decrease the weather risks. And a lot of farmers um, have, have um, gone to hoop housing uh, for winter. The next is to uh, reduce the livestock stress from extreme temperatures. And you can do that from a, a number of, of mechanisms uh, which are listed and then also make certain that all classes of, of, uh, of livestock uh, have access to fresh clean water, um, monitor their daily uh, intakes, and uh, you can do uh, have ventilated and proper cooling mechanisms within the barns which includes fat calf housing, lactating and dry cow facilities and access to shade while on pasture. Well, if you also have a long leash, you can take your oxen for a walk uh, to a shady glen, um, which you can see at Alderbrook Farm with Mr. Manley. Now, you can also, um, for number six, engage in farm planning and adaptive management. And uh, farmers should develop an adapt adaptation plan to identify the risks and practices to remediate them. Second, you should conduct a whole farm energy audit to increase the energy efficiency and opportunities for renewable energy sources. And then you uh, utilize precision farming, apps and weather as climate tools uh, to keep in touch with weather. You know, some years ago, about a decade ago, when I lived in Dartmouth, I, I uh, was part of the Dartmouth 350 committee. And as part of that, aside from working on the um, uh, Dartmouth Heritage Trail with a kiosk explaining historical farming in certain locations, such as Bakerville Road, where every single property was self-sufficient with, uh, they had a cow, they had the chickens, they had the vegetable gardens, they had an orchard, they had a vineyard. And uh, the milk production was actually uh, picked up eventually by Gulf Hill when pasteurization came into place. Um, uh, today, um, as I'll get into, we're sort of sad, sadly lacking that, um, but that can change. Um, so let's look and see what can be done. Um, now, there is some really um, smart planning that's taken place in Westport, and one of them was through the auspices of the town of Westport and the Westport Land Conservation Trust for I think it's called Berry Hill Farm on Pine Hill Road. And that was uh, protected from development um, by as astute planning uh, to bring the farm into a new generation of farmers. So, um, uh, so a new generation has taken over this farm and will continue this as being a, a blueberry farm farmed uh, organically and and, and using cli climate smart uh, techniques. So bravo to the Westport Land Conservation Trust in the town of Westport. Education is also critical. Um, during the World War, the Federal Victory Garden uh, Initiative uh, raised 60% of food uh, nationally to feed the troops and create a sustainable food network locally. 60%. Uh, today, only 5% of food is consumed 
consumed in Massachusetts is actually grown or raised in Massachusetts. The goal is to increase this, increase this to 30% in the future. So you can see um, 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 discussions in the field here. But today, Americans continue the Victory Garden program spirit of sustainability by producing and eating local food, reusing and recycling materials, and practicing sustainable gardening techniques to help protect the environment in an era of, in an era of climate uncertainty. Currently, the Westport Grange offers education pro programs on seed saving, permaculture, beekeeping, and native plants, and CMAP offers workshops and visits to local farms. Other venues, as Round the Bend Farm, offers regional celebratory programs on agriculture and, and animal husbandry. So I'm going to sort of step back in time um, to a celebration of agriculture that happened at Alderbrook Farm and the Dartmouth Grange. It was a farm to table event uh, hosted by CMAP. It was a circle of friendship uh, from farm to table, dinner and live auction that took place at Alderbrook Farm. And you see the farmers joining hands here. And that's something which I think, if you don't mind my saying, is critically missing today. I think that there's a need uh, for the farmers to join hands once again and work as a cohesive force. Because there's a lot of isolation in the farming community. And I think by uh, sharing issues and successes and failures, it could be like the 19th century, if you like, when um, you saw that the villages were composed of working parts. Uh, they had sustainable energy with windmills and water, <coughs> mill, water powered mills. Uh, they had, uh, there was the blacksmith. There was the uh, person who could uh, work leather. There's the different types of farmers. There were the masons, there were the builders. And so the farming community was, was actually created a self-sustaining community. And that, I think, is something that you may see more in future as uh, time progresses, as industrial agriculture becomes impossible um, in the United States and across the world with changes of climate and soils, etc. So there's going to be a need for this self-sustainability. So we can, number eight is individual and community victory gardens to keep food production local. Keeping food production local helps to maintain sustainability and just to dispel the impacts of climate change and national industrial agriculture on the South Coast. There are many farm stands, farmers markets, and community supported agriculture CSA programs that allow locals to buy locally to support our local farmers. Growing your own fruits and vegetables ensures nutrient dense production and it improves the mental and physical health of the gardeners. And I think we could look to Derek Christensen, who's improving the soil fertility, but also the nutritional value of of the uh, vegetables that he grows. And that, that's a lesson that I think can be learned for us all. So in Westport, the Westport Food Pantry has taken the initiative to develop a victory garden on the former poor farm lands now managed by the trustees of reservations. Here a model vegetable garden and orchard will be prepared and managed to help supply fresh produce for those in need combined with educational programs on how to create a victory garden on your own property. In Westport, 150 bags of food are given out each week by the food pantry for approximately 125 families. There is a realization that this and this is an undercount on the actual number of people who face food insecurity um, uh, for many. Initiating a victory garden movement on the South Coast will help to make climate change agricultural adaptation a family effort for the greater community and perhaps raise that number um, to 30% in future. And uh, this is uh, Nancy Manley uh, working at Alderbrook Farm, which was an education, really as well as it was both a 
a, a business, but also an educational endeavor um, for the region. And this is uh, just something that I worked on just to show that how simply this could be done for each and every one of us. This one happened to be done for, on Ricketson's Point, it was a vegetable and cutting garden um, for the Lofberg family. And uh, it shows you the basic layout and uh, then takes you through the processes of just marking out the soils uh, for the garden beds, um, removing the sod, and then incorporating kelp and seaweeds that have washed up on the shores at Ricketson Point in to improve uh, the soil fertility and uh, add well-composted manure and uh, just work it into the soil and uh, do the plantings with some irrigation. And you see how quickly everything grew. And it grew like Jack and the Beanstalk because with the kelp, it really took off. Uh, blueberries uh, lining the edge with underplantings beneath. So it was all done using organic um, uh, sort of permaculture uh, techniques. Um, now we shift to forestry. And Westport is also blessed with forest land. And forest land um, has um, an incredible benefit but first of all, let me just say that Westport is within the Narragansett, Bristol, Lowland, and Islands echo region, uh, which is flat to gently rolling, irregular plains where bedrock outcrops are uncommon, and a thick glacial till and outwash deposits cover the area. There are low gradient streams and numerous wetlands. The vegetation is coastally influenced oak and oak pine forest with various combinations of central hardwood species. Now, climate change has moderated this plant palette, and what you're seeing now is that trees that are at their southernmost uh, range, such as sugar maples, are uh, beech in the sugar maple forest are being replaced with the oaks. And the warmer temperature fluctuations in rainfall and humidity have allowed distinct destructive insects and disease to spread. This is evident in the explosion of beech tree woolly aphids in 2023, which weakened the native and non-native beech trees in our region, combined with beech leaf disease, which is slowly killing the native and European beech trees. Warmer winters allow for destructive insects to survive over the winter and hatch in spring in prodigious numbers, weakening the trees and allowing for pathogen and infections. Uh, and of course, trees have uh, multiple uh, uh, functions which are, uh, which are critical uh, to climate change and must be protected from cutting. Um, and uh, these include, uh, they, they take in CO2 through photosynthesis and store the carbon in their wood, their branches, their foliage, and their roots. And they can be stored for extended period of time. Um, they also filter water. They, they filter pollutants and they melt, uh, ameliorate uh, pollution, absorb heat, and provide cooling shade. Um, even in uh, um, exurban and suburban uh, areas, this is important and it certainly is critical within a cities. This shows you an aerial of the combination of both farming and forest land as uh, land that's productive woodlands. And, uh, there are certain criteria for that, uh, which you can read in, in the report. Now, if we were to shift um, our focus to uh, shellfish now and fisheries, we'll look at the anthropogenic impacts on shellfish and fisheries. First is pollution. You look at, at the uh, state, of, uh, state of Buzzards Bay for 2022, you see that this region is um, out of 100 points we have 46 points. It's up one point from the year before. And one of the issues, one of the critical issues is pollution. So, um, which impacts the shellfish habitats and fish runs. Uh, the, the problem is unfiltered stormwater runoff. According to Ross Moran, who's the director of the Westport Land Conservation Trust, major water quality improvements were seen with the installation of filtration lagoons and beds at a main road farm, which had impacted the Dunham's Brook watershed and the Salter Sea 
run brook trout, American eels, and banded killifishes, Dunham Brook habitat, as well as the shellfish beds at the west branch of the Westport River, which had to be closed. But after the filtration system, which you saw earlier uh, on the slide, it was able to open. Um, and Chris, Christopher Capone, who's the Westport Conservation Agent, stresses the need to contain and filter stormwater runoff from roadways and land before it enters Westport's rivers and streams. With climate change, Westport is seen an increase in nor'easters and torrential rains. Now, I'm showing you um, images of different types of trout. The Salters um, um, is on the upper, um, upper corner here uh, with the sort of uh, uh, red base. And then you have the, uh, the tiger trout, you have the brown trout, and you have the rainbow trout. And the reason I'm showing you these is because I'm going to show you um, a work that I'd done maybe a decade ago for Colgate University in New York, and I won a competition. And the competition was to take a look at um, their arboretum, but also at this drainage basin uh, that was completely a, a grassed, uh, yet was, I found out, a, a run for trout. And so they were unprotected, they were unshaded, and it was unsustainable. Um, so they allowed me to think about it, and when you start looking at what could be done, there's an incredible um, a diversity of, of, of trees and shrubs that not only uh, uh, will live within a, a floodplain setting, uh, but also have incredible biological and uh, biodiversity benefits, um, and also some that will remove pollutants. Um, so, um, if I had my magnifying glass, um, uh, you would see that we have, a, you can probably see better than I, um, but you can see you have a range of species with very specific um, benefits to the greater community, and I can go into that in more detail, um, if you like, af after the presentation. Um, now, uh, one of the issues uh, with shell fishing is you have excessive rainfall and flooding and sewage and septic runoff, uh, which affects shellfish beds and aquaculture. And as you're probably aware, quite recently, we've had a downgrading on the ability to harvest um, more than 18,000 acres of Dartmouth, Fairhaven, New Bedford coastline cohogging areas uh, off of outer uh, New Bedford Harbor. And they're now, um, and now also, there are, uh, this is an 11,000 acre increase in closures from roughly 7,000 acres in New Bedford Harbor that were closed in October 2023 over concerns of sewage classification. And uh, also, you should know that the state agency uh, also took a look at the shellfish beds along roughly 90,000 acres of Lower Buzzards Bay from Westport to Mattapoisett and out to the Elizabeth Islands. These will also be reclassified from being approved shellfishing areas to conditionally approved. Uh, these beds will be open to harvest except under emergency conditions like sewerage overflows, which occur during heavy rains. Shellfish caught in those areas also cannot be sold to the European Union, um, more locally, I might add. Um, now, here's something interesting. These are some observations uh, on the anthropogenic impacts of shellfishing and fisheries. Um, sea clams do not reach commercial size in Westport waters today, unlike in the past when there was a commercial market for them. I remember somebody saying about somebody having numbers of boats that was moored at Westport Point and uh, that you would harvest the sea clams. No longer. That fleet is gone. That fleet is sailed. Um, bay scallops, sprats, do not survive freshwater runoff during wet seasons. They require a set level of salinity to mature. This is why a boom year for bay scallops is a year of drought, such as in 2017. 
In the past, as in the present, little necks and cherry stone clams, quahogs, oysters, and aquaculture oysters are reliable and resilient harvest for local shell fishermen and women. According to Chris Leonard, inshore lobsters are practically non-existent, even for recreational gathering. Between the warming waters and the over-harvesting, lobsters are in short supply in local waters. This is also the case of swordfish, which were once abundant between the Gulf Stream and colder waters off of Westport Point. And I'll tell you a little story, because I spoke to Ginger um, Pierce, who you may or may not know of, but as a young girl, she was a, a river rat, and she joined her father and her brother on a retrofitted lobster boat, and they would go sword fishing, um, leaving from Westport Point. And the most, the most f uh, sustainable or functional or the very best the sword fishing area was between the Gulf Stream and the colder waters. It's the most productive zone. And there, um, the retrofitted lobster boat, they would make their way towards. And Ginger would clamber up the, uh, the rope ladder to the crow's nest, and she would peer for her brother who was to man the, uh, the dory below. And she sighted the scimitar, the curved, uh, fin of a very large swordfish um, in that location she called down to her brother and they made their way as close as they could in the retrofitted lobster boat and then the brother put down the dory and Ginger uh, joined him on, on, boat, on, on, on board and it, Ginger's job was to ginger the oak cask that held the, the, the line attached to the harpoon, and the brother was to man the harpoon and the oars. Well, they, they got as close as they could, rowing, uh, to the snoozing uh, swordfish who had just finished eating and now was digesting and napping on the surface. And then they sort of coasted toward the swordfish, and the swordfish was larger than the dory. And uh, the brother was able to plunge the harpoon into the back of the, of the swordfish. And the swordfish woke up with a start and took off. And with it, the line whizzed out of the oak cask. And it was uh, Ginger's job to stop the rope at a certain point when her brother called out, and she did. But the swordfish turned, and the swordfish, an angry swordfish, can destroy a dory without any effort at all, and he was coming full speed towards the dory. Well, the brother yelled to Ginger to let out the line, to let out the line, and the swordfish took off, and then Ginger stopped the line, and the swordfish took them on an Nantucket sleigh ride across the waters. In the meantime, uh, the father's chugging along in his retrofitted lobster boat, trying to catch up, and eventually he did. The swordfish was tiring, and he was able to plunge a harpoon in, and uh, they hauled the swordfish in. The swordfish was bigger than the dory, and if I'm not mistaken, I seem to recall Ginger saying that it was weighed about 750 pounds uh, with the head and the tail cut off. That's a lot of swordfish. And uh, so uh, they made their way back to Westport Point. And by the time they got there, the crowd had, had gathered. They'd heard that a, giant, that a mammoth swordfish was on its way, somehow. And um, they arrived, and pictures were taken. And so, years later, um, I'd been interviewing Gus Gannett. And when Gus Gannett, who was an eel fisherman and a, and a, and a, 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 a shell fisherman and fisherman, on Westport, uh, on uh, Horseneck Road, East, um, died. His daughter called me and she said, I'd like you to look at some photographs. So I did, and I saw some photographs of, of a swordfish being weighed at Westport Point. So I said, yes, I'd love these photographs because I was doing the Farmers and Fishers Portraits, Words and Tools for Dartmouth at the time. And um, so I did, and what I did is I, was talking to Ginger, who was in her 90s at this time, 
And I said, Ginger, I, I'd like to give you a photograph. So I gave her the photograph and um, it showed um, a little girl coming up the dock and an enormous swordfish with a circle of people on a, uh, surrounding a scale at Westport Point. And Ginger called me the next day and she said, Joseph, you know the photograph you gave me? Did you see the little girl on the dock? That's me. So it came full circle. So I was very, very pleased to be able to give that to Ginger before she died and then to tell the story at, at, uh, as part of a eulogy for her when she died. Um, so, uh, so let me go on. In Westport, currently we have charter operations that seek out the blue and yellow fin tuna, billfish, striped bass and bluefish, um, and with, off with offshore excursions. Local fishermen and women are adapting, though, uh, to the changing fisheries by using fish pots and gill nets for monkfish, skate, scup, and sea bass to supplement their lobster harvest. So the new fish of the day is the black bass. You can see in the, um, in the, the central photograph there. That's a southern fish. But that's replacing the striped bass in these waters today because the waters are warming. Uh, so if you look at these charts, you can see that the water warming within this area is off the charts. Uh, the Gulf of Maine, which stretches from Cape Cod to Nova Scotia, has warmed faster than nearly any, any other track of ocean on Earth as climate change joined forces with a natural oceanographic pattern called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation to increase sea surface temperatures by 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit from 20, uh, 2004 to 2013. The results have been an ecological transformation, an upheaval in marine fisheries management, an alarming window into the warm future of global oceans. And that's testified by Yale Environment 360. There's also another issue, um, and it's the U.S. shelf ecosystem. And here you're having marine heat waves, and you can see in these images the dark red, ocean, dark red temperature change, that's not good. You know, that isn't good. Um, so the marine heat waves are becoming more common and seasons in the oceans are changing. These physical changes affect fish populations and their habitat. Some traditionally important species is Atlantic cod, yellowfin flounder, winter flounder, summer flounder, silver hake and herring, and lobsters at the southern end of their range are declining as species as black sea bass, Atlantic butterfish, longfin squid, and blue crabs from the south are emerging in New England waters. For fishermen and women, these ocean changes require adaptation and resilience. Now, if we're looking at some of the strategies, I'm going to ask for your help uh, on this. Um, for shell fishing, we're asking um, to uh, work, one, to work towards restoring shellfish habitat. Two, examine and retrofit storm drains leading to streams, rivers, and bays to filter out pollution. Three, to restore, recede, expand the bay scallop, quahog, and oyster beds. Four, consider using oysters for aquaculture and reef building to mitigate storm damage. You know, when I was, I was an artist in residence years and years ago, um, when I was doing work called Landscape Mosaics on Wellfleet, so Wellfleet allowed me to use their sanctuary, the Audubon uh, Sanctuary, um, to do installations there. And I learned that uh, prior to colonization, there was an incredible uh, reef system that surrounded the harbor that uh, the uh, early Europeans weren't able to get inshore because of. Uh, so the reefs, like coral reefs, oyster reefs, help to mitigate climate change and uh, storm, storm surges. So I'll just put that as an aside, that oysters left to their own devices over time will create reef systems and the reef systems will help to, uh, uh, to mitigate storm damage. 
anadromous fish. Anadromous fish are those fish that, uh, that um, um, live their lives in salt water but return to fresh water to, to, to spawn and then return if they can to, to fresh water to die. And uh, they include herring and shad, for example, and sturgeon. Um, now the salter's trout we mentioned before is diadromous, which means that it lives its, its lives pretty much in salt water, um, but, I'm sorry, in fresh water, but is a, an occasional visit to salt water, but um, for cool, for, for food sources, for example. So for anadromous fish, you want to review dam closures and undersized culverts impacts upon anadromous fish runs. Um, you want to retrofit dams and fishways to remove the dams to accommodate fish runs to, for upstream spawning runs and create a non-fragmented open space network of wildlands surrounding vulnerable fish migration routes. And that's something that Westport can certainly do. Um, pelagic fish, uh, fish that live their lives at sea, uh, follow the migrating native fish schools northward or adapt to non-native fish species. Uh, two, work with mass fisheries managers to allow the taking of most abundant species. And three, review the, men, uh, the taking of menhaden from factory ship operations for sustainability and the impacts of the herring, fish, uh, herring population. What you should know about uh, factory, uh, if you're not familiar, factory uh, fish uh, fishing involves having a mothership and a spotter plane. A spotter plane sites out these massive migrations of fish like the menhaden, which is one of the most popular species on earth at one time. I'm not certain at this, at this point in time, but at one time. And what they do is they then send out a series of, of boats that have netting attached. They encircle the entire school. And then what they do is they put in a vacuum system, they vacuum the fish into the hold. The hold then goes into a freezers. And so they're like flash frozen um, from the vacuum to the flash freezer. And so it's indiscriminate because it, it's also taking the river herring, uh, which is really, really down these days. So between factory fishing and uh, the, uh, the dam closures and pollution, herring and other anadromous fish are in short supply, and we hope that's going to change in the future. So what I'm going to do is ask for your advice. What can we do? How is your farm affected? And as part of the, the handouts today, um, it included not only the, the program notes, um, a, an excerpt of the slides, but also a, um, a questionnaire that's asking for your advice um, to describe your farming or fishing operation. How is temperature variability, precipitation uncertainty, and sea level rise concerns affected your farming for temperature, precipitation, sea level rise? How are you adapting to seasonal changes that affect your business? What recommendations would you suggest um, that the community could work towards and what policies and long-term planning strategies would improve the future outlook for you. Um, so I'm going to ask your advice on that and I hope you'd, you don't mind but I included a little bio here and I hope you don't consider me to become a member of the Kardashian family but I think that uh, uh, many people don't know what I, what I do so I added a little bio just so you know where I'm coming from. But, I would open the floor and ask for your, your advice or questions. Thank you. Any questions or concerns? Uh, yes, Fred. Soils, like forests, sequester carbon. 
And I think it's important to realize that, that healthy soil, as I, as I recall, if you look at what the, uh, the prairies of the Midwest and West prior to colonization had a very, very high percentage of carbon sequestration. With the plowing came the Dust Bowl, and with the Dust Bowl came the diminishment of, of soil quality and also its ability to retain. I think in this region, I think um, it's down to like five to 10% um, for agricultural land, but that can be improved, and it's improved um, through having healthy soils. And you improve the healthy soils with the addition of, of, of compost and manures, and also to let the, let the soil live. Uh, don't dose it with killing pesticides and fungicides, but allow nature through organic and permaculture techniques to take hold. And with that, I think you'll improve the abilities of the local soils to renew themselves. Because remember, uh, nature l likes to heal itself. And, you know, and it's true of the prairies, it's true of farm soils, and it's true of many ecosystems across the globe. I'll give you an example. Um, I've been doing some work recently on coral reefs, of all things. So it's, it's a collaboration between science, uh, scientists at Woods Hole and MIT, um, uh, Oceans Program, and, and artists to help communicate issues of climate change. So um, I, was, I was invited to Thailand to give a talk on uh, climate resilience in coral, coral reefs. And uh, what we found is that coral reefs, like other, like other ecosystems, are are adaptive. Um, and what you're finding that over millennial time, and in some instances shorter, you're finding that corals have adapted to turbidity, which is in the Red Sea, um, at a reef in the Red Sea, they've, uh, uh, to turbidity, uh, to turbidity, to ocean temperature rise, um, which is off of the island of Palau, and also to, um, chemical infusions, which is off of Papua New Guinea. So you're finding the coral left to its own devices, uh, like other ecosystem and other, other, will adapt. The question is, can they adapt quickly enough? And so that's, I think, where we need, uh, we need to help instead of hinder. So that's something that um, I think we can work towards uh, here. And uh, as farmers and fishermen, so so I'll ask your advice. Other questions? Let, let me uh, suggest a, a way we can get your feedback, or a couple of ways we can get your feedback, and and also try and add an answer, Fred, to, to your question on on soils, because I I think there's a huge amount in what uh, Joseph has put together here. There, there's a lot to digest. And uh, you've got Joseph's email here. And so if you want to get a uh, copy of this for, say, CMAP, uh, I, you can email Joseph, and I'm sure you, you've got this electronically, right? I do. Yeah, you said so about he, the report. He could get you this uh, report electronically if you wanted to distribute it to a, a wider audience. Uh, and please feel free to share that because there's a lot of information here. And we would love you to share that, whether it's to CMAP or to the Westport uh, Land Trust or to the Ag Commission or to other groups. Uh, I think that if we get, uh, uh, when we get this report done, uh, the recommendations for how to deal with climate change in Westport 
aren't going to be that different than how you would deal with climate change in Dartmouth or Little Compton or you know nearby areas. So it's useful to work on this with other organizations. The problems are are similar. So we wanted everyone kind of pitching in on this. I think, because uh, it's getting late, that uh, these questions that Joseph is asking, uh, you may not want to fill them out here tonight, but there, if you want to take this home, there's two ways you could get the information. We really do want your input farmers, which makes sense, but I'm wondering if there should be more of a community-wide approach of how everyone can help support agriculture. Mm -hmm. So by having such things as planting native plants, local pollinators, which are mm -hmm. um, the farmers, or maybe installing backyard palm ponds to support amphibian populations within, which feed on the pests that are expected to increase, mm -hmm. things like of that nature. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific, those are terrific ideas, and certainly that's something that could be incorporated in, into the report. And perhaps we could work together, I think, because you are with the watershed uh, for Westport, and maybe we could collaborate and integrate your ideas and, and, the, West, and the watershed's idea in, into the report. Thank you. I would love to do that. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I think there was a... Uh I went to a seminar and they talked about shopping local. And if everybody in Massachusetts uh, shopped, uh, put $5 aside to shop local, it would be in the millions of dollars a week. Just $5 a week to shop local. Right, you do it. That's what I was going to say. Can I respond 
Susan? Mm -hmm. uh, great points. Very good points. What I really liked about what's in the report is it takes an issue like climate change, which can be overwhelming. Oh my God, how can I confront this issue? I mean, I'm going to throw up my hands. I, I can't tackle that. And you look at the eight strategies. Well, I can do that. I can do that. They, those strategies, I can diversify my crops, it, are strategies that people can put in place. Um, you don't have to put in place all eight, right? But you can look at them and you can say, well, I can do these things. And so what's necessary? Some of the things you just talked about. The power of example, and that's what's in the report. As Joseph said, here's a farm in Westport that's already doing this, right? So it's possible because they're already doing it. So it's power of example. And then it's, are there incentives, which you just talked about. And so uh, Fred and I were talking about, you know, could we get together and do a carbon credit that would encourage no-till, uh, so that if we're going to keep the carbon in the ground, can we, you know, get the Climate Resilience Committee and CMAP and the Conservation Trust and the Ag Commission and Rep Schmidt or whoever succeeds him, you know, working to create a carbon credit to encourage people with information, first of all, of here's how you do it, here's who's already doing it, and if you do do it, there's like a solar renewable energy credit for putting solar panels, here's a, uh, uh, a carbon credit that you will be eligible for. Uh, I'm on the planning board I mentioned. We have reviewed I don't know how many applications for, I would call it, industrial scale solar panels on farms, which I look at, boy, this is a way that this farm can make additional money and stay in the farming business instead of growing another, the last crop of houses. If, if this farm has some solar panels, that's a, a new income stream. So, anyway, yeah. So there, there's some pretty uh, good models for uh, carbon credits. Uh, when people think of carbon credits, they primarily think of forest carbon credits. Um, but there's been a lot of work out of the University on what the saturation point of the land is and what percentages would be used as carbon percentages for carbon. And, and with that, there's trying to be more acceptance of the concept of carbon credits for farming. Now, the problem there, and it's the same problem with forestry, is that small landowners, there's considerable cost to uh, both determine what the current carbon content is, and then also be able to measure ongoing to satisfy that there's actually being carbon. But what you're starting to see again in both the United States and Canada is you're starting to see mutual organizations coming together across the broad spectrum of territory, so not just within the town, but multi town, multi community. Uh, and where the mutual organization actually contracts for the carbon credits and then allocates them out on a mutual basis based on each of the individual landowners. So there's some, it's on like a mutual fund concept for carbon credits. So, you know, there's certainly some interesting models. And I think one of the things that, you know, to the point earlier about the cost pressures, is that 
fragmentation of open space in Westport and surrounding communities, if you did have that a contiguous uh, open space network, especially along the stream court, et cetera, that that would be a great benefit. And whether it's done with a combination of, of uh, the hydric uh, wetland plants with the 
that you could supply with the shrubs, with the trees, that each have biological and biodiverse uh, uh, benefits to it, uh, that would be terrific. Um, may I add, the head of Westport is a perfect example of where we have a valley with just, just come, with runoff coming from all different directions to mm -hmm. the Westport River mm -hmm. that is mowed to this tall mm -hmm. to dirt all summer long. Oh, yeah. We're paying, our taxes are paying to do that and mowing right up to the stones, which the natural, if you left a buffer of native plants there, they would hold those, the, those stone walls together. We wouldn't have to be rebuilding them. Mm -hmm. They would keep people from walking on them. They would bring pollinators and they would help with the runoff and catch the runoff and mm -hmm. they would slow it in the place we need it more than anything yet. The town continues. My mother's been advocating for this for years. Oh, I, I remember. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. Um, and it's just insane to me and it, it drives me crazy. It's just literally the easy, you can do less and have um, a, a benefit to the entire community um, and cost us less too. And sure. Even, to, even if you didn't plant anything, just stopped mowing so much and so low, and it would stop the, the longer grass would help keep the geese away. Which everybody's complaining about the geese. Well, they they like they like um, golf courses, right? So really low grass. If you keep the grass longer, they'll be healthier. It'll look better. Have some areas that aren't mowed. Have some patches of native plants, um, or you know, seed it. Like there's many ways to go about it. But. Yeah. Well, maybe we we could collaborate and talk to can talk to the town and actually do something about it. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, more more voices might help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's a that's a, a great idea and it's sort of long overdue in many respects because there's a real issue I think with uh, with uh, uh, intrusion there, both there and upstream. So. It's a, it's, a, it's the it's a poster child for the problem. Yeah. There's, it can be done in other places, but. Uh huh. Great. Anyone else with comments or concerns? No? Well, I want to thank you very much for coming. And, and I hope that you, you uh, follow John's urgings. And if you can, you know, fill out the form um, or write your concerns. It doesn't have to be on a form. Um, just let us know, and what I'll do is we can incorporate it in, into the into the planning process, and have it have your voices matter, and they do matter. So, it's, uh, and it's for the benefit of the of the larger community. So, thank you very much for coming, and.